This is TomorrowPictures.tv. On the basic American principle that every man has a concern in all public matters and that he has a right to form and deliver an opinion on them, Dan Smoot, coordinator of Facts Forum, presents for your consideration one of the vital issues confronting our republic today. Hi. I have been reading some fascinating documents on the Korean War and they bring a question to my mind. Is it wise for us to engage in truce negotiations with the Chinese Communists? Facts Forum holds that no such questions as that can be intelligently answered unless both sides are fairly reviewed. So, let's review both sides of this question. First, the affirmative. If we reject any opportunity to negotiate an honorable settlement in Korea, we commit ourselves to a program of war and we strengthen the Soviet propaganda theme that they are a peace-loving people while we are imperialistic warmongers. The hope of all just men is a lasting peace and we must demonstrate to the world by act and deed that we welcome every honest act of peace. The world must know that America stands ready to work with renewed resolve to redeem the near lost hope of our day. The first step is an honorable armistice in Korea. The experiences of two world wars have taught us that the doctrine of unconditional surrender makes wars infinitely destructive and peace virtually impossible. Yet unconditional surrender is the aim of those reckless few who would have us throw caution to the wind, reject all suggestions of arbitration, and go it alone in an all-out war in Asia. But in sober reality, what would be the result of an all-out war in Asia? an offensive on the Chinese mainland or even in Korea. A frontal assault along the present battle line would be deadly. The communists are firmly entrenched in deep fortifications all along the narrow waist of Korea. To throw American troops against those defenses would commit them to wholesale slaughter. We might indeed destroy a great many Chinese, but with 75% of their forces held in reserve, that would be no great loss to them and no real victory for us. An encircling move by sea might cut off great numbers of communist troops, but that would expose us to attack from Manchuria. Then there is the absurd idea of a naval blockade of the China coast. This reckless action could easily involve us in a series of dangerous incidents with Russian vessels. But even if we avoided such tension with Russia, what about our friends who carry on legitimate trade with the Chinese communists and whose economies depend on that trade? Britain, Ceylon, Pakistan, India. And how much real advantage would a blockade of the China coast gain us? Most of the weapons China is receiving come in by rail from Russia. To blockade her coast, to deprive her of harmless trade with the West and the rest of Asia, would be to push her even more rapidly and finally into complete dependence upon the Soviets. Further, such a blockade would so scatter our naval power as to render us helpless in the event of an all-out Soviet attack on us. It's obvious then that the only chance for a complete and total military victory in Korea would be the use of atomic weapons, a barbaric action which brings horror to the hearts of all civilized men and violates all concepts of humanity. We would wreck thousands of villages and cities and murder millions of innocent Chinese whose desire for peace is no less than our own. Our only hope of avoiding this catastrophe is to follow the courageous and sound policy which has already dealt the Soviet bloc the only blow really suffered since the end of World War II and has done it at a minimum cost to ourselves. In terms of high strategy, the Reds have lost the war in Korea, and they know it. 
We went into Korea to stop communist aggression, and we have succeeded. The communists went into Korea to conquer it, with the purpose of using it as a buffer or a springboard in case of a general war. But among the nations of the free world, the lofty principle of collective security was put to the acid test, and it worked. The United Nations, without setting off a third world war, has held Soviet imperialism in check on the Korean Peninsula, giving the communists proof that aggression is no longer profitable. We have prevented the communists from gobbling up all of Asia and have given the free world time and opportunity to build up its own defenses. We stand now on the threshold of a just and lasting peace for all men. Are we to disregard this chance to prove once and for all, to friend and foe alike, that we are a moral, humane people? Or will we abandon the opportunity for the ghastly consequences of all-out war? Such a course would bring upon us the harsh judgment of all peoples, now and throughout the course of future history. Whenever and wherever the enemy shows a disposition to talk peace and displays a sincerity of peaceful purpose, we must meet him on those terms. If he's bluffing, we call his bluff before the world. That is one side of the question. But here's the other, the negative, the view of those who think it is unwise for us to engage in truce negotiations with the Chinese communists. In April 1953, we agreed with the communists to exchange all sick or wounded prisoners. We handed over 6,000 of theirs they returned 120 Americans. The communists had simply used the hoax of prisoner exchange as a cover to bring up ammunition and supplies to their frontline troops. What did we do about it? The United Nations passed a resolution expressing hope that all would go well. The little handful of exchanged American prisoners told stories of brutality, starvation, and torture, of Americans shot in the back of the head or kicked off a road to die because they were too weak to take forced marches. And what did we do about that? The United Nations, of course, did nothing. A British labor peer made international headlines by vilifying the United States, saying that all of this talk about communist atrocities was just American war propaganda. President Eisenhower confessed a heavy heart about it, and various public commentators registered great shock. Shock about what? Is it possible that no one remembers the news broken to us in November 1951 when General Ridgway admitted that over 8,000 United States prisoners of war had already been slaughtered by the Chinese communists in an orgy of killing and barbarism? How can anyone willing to look at the facts think that any good can come out of negotiations with the communists? Look at some of the facts. In mid-1951, the magnificent United States Eighth Army had completely routed the enemy in Korea and was on the point of annihilating him. But we held our soldiers back and eagerly accepted Russia's proposal for truce talks. We suggested that the talks be held on a Danish hospital ship. The Reds wanted to hold them at Kaesong, and we gave in. Although holding the talks at Kaesong meant that a large area right in the path of our rapidly advancing forces was immune from attack. Moreover, Kaesong was in communist territory, which meant that our men had to go to them, carrying white flags, looking to all the world as if we were coming hat in hand to beg for terms, when it was the Reds who were broken and on the run. The communists kept us talking at Kaesong until they had repaired their military position. They broke off the talks with the trumped up charges that we had bombed the neutralized zone. While we were busy investigating their outrageous charges, they struck again. There followed 69 days of savage fighting, the bloody period of Heartbreak Ridge, and the loss of thousands of America's finest soldiers. The communists, however, once again, beaten and needing time to build up strength, came back for more talk, this time at Panmunjom, another place which they had selected. We entered this second round of talks agreeing to a 30-day ceasefire, which gave the Reds ample time to repair airfields, build their defenses in depth, 
and bore into those granite hills 30 feet deep. We finally broke off the talks in October 1952, but in April 1953, we leaped with as much unseemly haste as before when the Reds suggested prisoner exchange and more talk. To the communists, negotiation is a military and political tactic, not an attempt to reach a common ground of understanding. So the Soviets decide to end the Korean War now, largely on their terms. When will they start it again? 10 days, 10 months, 10 years from now? Whenever it serves their purpose. Meanwhile, having negotiated a wedge between us and whatever friends we may have left in the Far East, they can use their Chinese puppets to conquer the remainder of Asia, beginning in Malaya and Indochina. Generals MacArthur and Van Fleet say that our armies have several times been on the point of destroying the enemy in Korea, but each time have been deliberately held back by our policymakers in Washington and in the United Nations. They also say that there can be no peace in Asia until the communist military power is broken in Korea. We have everything it takes to do it, to get our men home and keep them home everything that is except the statesmanship to make the decision. Whether we should have got into the Korean mess in the first place, after our apostles of Soviet appeasement had helped the communists conquer all of China, is not pertinent to this particular discussion. The fact is that we committed our men to a war in Korea. And in war, there is no substitute for victory. There then are the two sides, briefly put, of this immensely important question. Should we engage in truce negotiations with the Chinese Communists? It is not the purpose of Facts Forum to provide an answer for such questions as that, but rather to focus public attention on them, in the belief that the best way to solve our problems is to create public interest in them. In short, Facts Forum is a campaign against public indifference. We believe but if the people will find the facts, they will find an answer. Dan Smoot, coordinator of Facts Forum, has brought to your attention another decision that must be made by you and your fellow Americans. To express your views and to receive free printed copies of Mr. Smoot's remarks, write Facts Forum in care of this station. Is tomorrow pictures. And I don't know why everybody be saying, Did you really do that? What? They did too. I just told them they did. All of us have done no, 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 <laughs>